Hi, everyone. I'm Natalia. I work in the global communications team at 350. Uh, I have around 13 years of experience with journalism and communications for institutional communications for um, NGOs, uh, strategic communications and relationship with media. So I'll be running this training um, for us to try to understand better how to deal with media, uh, how to get uh, to the news, and also a few tips and tricks on how to give an interview. So first of all, I'd like us, because we are a small group, I'd like us to do a quick go around uh, to introduce ourselves. Um, and I'd like to hear from you, like, why you became an, a climate activist, um, why you decided to participate in this training today and what you hope to gain from this training. Sorry, I forgot to say that I'm Brazilian and I'm based in, in Rio. Um, I see Mir Miriam, Jess and Valesia. Sorry if I'm not, and Regina as well. Anyone else would like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'll go. Um, my name is Miriam. She, her. I live in Portland, Oregon, and I've been volunteering with the local 350, 350 PDX on the story strategy team. My background's in advertising, and um, I'm learning about this different kind of storytelling, and media is a huge part of it, and um, just having the narratives that are so important getting out there in ways where they can have an impact is uh, what I'm interested in. Thank you, Miriam. Anyone else would like to introduce yourselves? Um, otherwise, we should just move on. Okay. So what we'll cover, sorry, I see Jess in on the chat. Um, I can read it out loud. Hi, I'm going to be participating in chat today. No worries, Jess, welcome anyways. Uh, based in US San Francisco, um, don't work in climate activists, but work in social justice. I wanted to participate because I'm starting on the comms team at my organization. I'm curious about media and hope to become more confident in my messaging. Awesome. Uh, messaging and creating your own uh, key messages is one of the topics of this training as well. So hope to, to meet your expectations. So what we'll cover today is, first of all, why we use the medium, uh, getting the shoes of journalists and understanding how they operate uh, and what they, they would like us to give them. Uh, secondly, developing messages. Um, and third, interview tips and tricks. So first of all, why do we use the medium? Um, every communicator should use all the platforms uh, available to activate the base, the, uh, the supporters that we already have in our own organizations. Um, persuade the middle, which are people that are either not yet uh, familiarized with the subject or uh, not decided yet in which side they will go and show the opposition for the outliers they are. So uh, come with concrete arguments um, to tell a story that contradicts uh, the opposition, what you're, what you're fighting and um, the, the targets that you wanna, um, you wanna reach. So although it might feel that your ideas are not always um, the majority in an interview, the media is always a vehicle um, for, for us to speak to the public. So don't think about the media as the audience itself, um, but as the channel, as the, um, the vehicle that we'll, you will, will be speaking with the public. So sometimes we also consider specific journalists or a niche uh, outlet or a niche journalist as our audience as well. Um, but when we are using the media to reach people, we, we need to think about what the people in the other side 
we want to we want to to read or see or watch um so how are we going to reach them and really speak to them that on something that they will, they will relate to and yeah and and really be moved by that in order to make a change or uh join our call to action and in our campaigns and support our campaigns and all that so um the public may be more sympathetic and persuadable uh, or on, on our side than those uh, established voices in the newsrooms uh, assume them to be. So we need to work with that, um, with that expectations, with that um, assumption of the public. We always need to, to think that they can be persuaded, they can learn and hear what you're saying and actually sometimes even uh, change sides to, to, to be uh, sympathetic to what you're saying. Next, Tony, please. <clears throat> so uh, another thing that is really important um, and is something that 350 works really hard to do and all their other um, cross-sectional uh, and intersectional movements uh, also do is to uh, reinforce equity in storytelling. So we recognize that the media landscape is often dominated by privilege um, and those with access. So currently, most people you see on the media are white, middle class, cisgender men. And this representation creates a power imbalance in the media where some people feel entitled to be the voices of certain, on, on certain issues. Um, and this also applies to the newsrooms uh, where the demographic is often middle-class, white, educated, uh, on public school educated, and this replicates the culture codes of those groups, right? So this could feel alienating and sometimes hostile to working class people. Uh, people of color, disabled people, LGBTQ plus uh, folks, and people from different marginalized backgrounds um, can find it hard to be to feel comfortable doing media work or uh, acting as a spokespeople. Often feeling like they aren't the best person for the job, which we call the imposter syndrome. Uh, and we need to change that. Uh, we want to change that. So this is a, a really important point for, for us. And how are we going to do that? By opening space for people to tell their own stories in their own words. Uh, sometimes uh, when we deal with local communities, traditional communities, indigenous peoples, they have their own pace uh, when telling a story. And the, the media, especially TV, is really quick uh, and have this own pace, uh, especially when we are speaking about global North, Europe, US outlets and, and media landscapes. And they wanna rush uh, those, those people uh, to tell the stories the way they wanna hear it or see it. Uh, but it's not the same uh, as if they would tell in their own um, style, their own uh, communicating uh, pace in, in four months. So we need to let them do that on their own. Uh, also passing the microphone, not wanting to speak for others, uh, let them tell their own stories, making opportunities accessible for everyone and supporting each other. Next. Uh, so what does healthy storytelling look like? <clears throat> Storytelling that is free from harmful stereotype, harmful, sorry, stereotypes, honoring the effort, the risk that sometimes uh, many spokespeople are uh, face being featured in media, and then the vulnerability required to share their stories. Uh, we want to enable people to speak for themselves, uh, building relationships for the long term. Um, nothing about us without us. Uh, so when we are, you are telling a story from others, you need to pass the microphone for them to tell their own story. And, and 
feature the people that uh, are the, the main characters of that story. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's basically it. Next. Feel free to drop a star or raise your hand, um, drop a star in the chat or just raise your hand if you have any questions during everything that I'm speaking. I'm gonna be pausing sometimes, but uh, feel free to, to ask any questions anytime. Uh, I, I'm just looking at the chat now and I see Valesia uh, sharing that uh, she's French speaker based in Cameroon, just started to work in the climate activism, and I hope to learn more. Thanks, and nice to, to have you here with us. Okay, so second uh, topic of this training is developing messages. Um, so we develop our messages to activate the base, as I said, uh, and keep them engaged, keep our supporters engaged, and keep like our relationships with the media and strength and that re those relationships first weigh the middle and show the opposition the outliers they are. Uh, so we're gonna discuss a few tips and then share the message uh, and do a, a short practical exercise. I plan to do that um, in breakout groups, but as we are a very small cohort, um, let's do that in the the main room. Have you? Um, heard or seen Marge Simpson. I assume at least some of you have. Um, so Marge is a character, a very well-known character from um, a US um, movie. And can can someone describe uh, what you, how you see Marge Simpson? Someone that knows? Um, She's very concerned about the well-being of her family. Um, she's kind of the anchor who gets everything done. And um, I think that's about the most important thing I can say. She's uh, like the straight man to everybody else's humor. Yeah, that's that's uh, certainly her. And also she's um, middle class, housewife, uh, housekeeper. Uh, caregiver who stays at home and take care of her, of her children. We could say that she leaning she leans more towards cons a conservative family. Um, so this is how we try to frame this. Um, the persuadable middle that we we see we, we speak about, we think about the margins of our of our lives. So, Picture this person in your life. Who is this person um, that doesn't really, is not an activist, so doesn't have all the knowledge or um, the information about specific jargons, concepts that we use in our work in the climate movement. Uh, someone that doesn't have um, a strong idealistic uh, position on, on a few topics that we work on but someone also that could be open and could be sensitive to a few, um, yeah, to a, a few um, levels or um, sides of our story, of the story we, we wanna tell. So is this your dad? Could be your grandma or a cousin or an aunt uh, or a friend. So who is, the marge that we try to picture here. They, they don't understand the jargon uh, you use in your workplace or your campaign because they don't work in your workplace or campaign uh, or anything similar. If you just, this is someone that if you just throw numbers and statistics on at them, they will switch off. Uh, they're not interested. Uh, most people switch off when you just throw numbers and statistics at them. They don't understand those numbers. Um, and they will probably respond best to you, including some sort of story to illustrate what you say and try to personalize the story so they can um, really, uh, so that can really resonate and they, they can identify with that with what you're, you're telling. 
next. So to try and persuade the margins of our lives, uh, how, we, how should we talk to them? Um, so this is a proposal for an exercise. We are not going to break out rooms, uh, but rather I would like to ask you to do that individually by yourselves. We can take two minutes uh, to do that. So think about a campaign you were working on and try to explain the main issue of your campaign uh, as if you were talking to your march. Um, so keep in mind, to limit jargon and statistics, include a story to illustrate. And then after this two minutes, we're gonna share back in the main room. Is that okay? While you're thinking, I just read Natalie's comment on the chat and she says, Marge is a woman who is very committed to protecting her family. And she says she likes her pragmatic nature. And I would like to reinforce that because Marge uh, may be a bit alienated from the topic, at least the topic that we are speaking about, uh, because it's very niche. Um, but she has values of her own. And it's to, that, to those values that we need to set a common ground and speak to. Like, how are we going to reach Marge through her values, to the, value, the values that we both share. What are the, 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 the shared values that we can um, bring up to, to try and reach her, her feelings and make her sympathize with our cause? Anyone would like to share? Um, I could share. Uh, Marge, the summers are so hot now. It's so hot in my house. How about yours? We're all miserable, especially the dog. I just heard Sally up the street died yesterday because of the heat. Her upper story apartment got so hot and she's in a wheelchair and all. It's awful. Since our summers are so much hotter now, people like her and us really need the city government to help us get affordable cooling devices into our homes and to plant more trees for shade. I'm going to a town hall about it next week. You want to come? You can tell them what it's been like in your house. That's more one-to-one -one than media, but that's what I wrote. Yeah, I love that. A few comments. Um, th thanks for sharing, Miriam. Uh, I think, first of all, you use it very simple words, and that is great. Like for television, at, uh, for instance, it's super important to be like simple and use like normal words that people will the common people will understand. You also brought up like the dog, which is something that Marge has and we know. Uh, you brought a, a, like a very usual topic, which is heat and, 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 and everyone can feel heat. We can, we can deny climate change if you want, but we cannot deny that this, these days are hotter than Previous, in previous years. You also brought um, the call to action, what you want, your demands. You said you want the government to do something. And you said uh, what you're going to do and invited her to join you. So this is something, because there's another important thing when we bring up like very uh, dramatic and complex uh, subjects like climate change, we need to bring hope as well. Because if we only bring despair, people will just turn their, their backs off and like, okay, if there's no solution for this, we cannot do anything. We're just gonna be desperate and, you know, be depressive. So we always need to bring the alternative and the possibility to change um, and the solution that we wanna see uh, with the vision of the world we want to see in the future we want to see. So you brought uh, hope, you brought something that she can do and you invited her to join you. So this is really like basic things that uh, we want our audience to, to hear. We want to share with our audience. So it's, it, it was really good. Cool. We can move. Oh, sorry. Um, I see Jazz comments. Um, 
I like that you had the invite action, Miriam. It left it in their hands to do something. I didn't have that in mind. Yeah. As I said, like we we need to share our demands, what we want people to do, either the authorities or specific corporations or finance institutions, whatever targets do we have, uh, but we need to share our demands for those targets and what we as like the population and civil society needs to do as well from our part, our end, and also what we can do and invite people to join us in, in doing that. Okay, um, next, Tony, please. So how to connect your audience and their emotions. Uh, this is basically what we just did in this uh, exercise. So first of all, uh, we need to tell a story, right? Storytelling is a great strategy to engage our audience and develop an emotional, emotional connection. Stories are what move us, right? And they are visual approach to our messaging, making people more exciting and mem memorable. Uh, and they use colors to describe images or describe feelings or tastes or anything. A second good strategy is to use humor, compassion, and empathy. So never underestimate the power of emotions. And if someone can make you smile or shed a tear, you know there's a pretty strong emotional bond there. These emotions are great to tap into because as humans, we love to relate. So always try to reach people through their emotions because everyone has emotions uh, apart from sociopaths, but even those I think have some kind of emotions. So appeal to the, their emotions and frame the issue. What is the impact that is having in the world? What like you choose the issue of heat, right? Um, heat waves. What is the impact that is having in your community and in the world uh, as a whole? What is the way forward in addressing it? How, how do we solve this problem? What are you doing about it? Uh, in Miriam's example, she said she was going to a town hall to discuss issues with authorities. So um, this is what she's doing about it. And this is what people in her neighborhood or her community, closed community can do as well. Next. Um, Pick a side and make your case. Your audience is looking to you as the expert when it comes to your content. So in order to be considered as an expert, uh, not only you must provide valuable insights, but you must also take a firm stance um, on something, on the issue you are uh, promoting or presenting. So back up your points with hard evidence. Maintain your credibility by accurately sitting your sources and imagery. So every time you share um, either, whether it's a, a data or a number, or even like another, a different source of news, news you need to sit, uh, yeah, to, to bring the source of that um, information and be objective and professional. Um, ask the right questions to make them think. The easiest way to connect emotionally and drive more engagement amongst uh, your, audience, your audience is to question them or your interviewer or the presenter or the journalist. Ask, ask them, you can also ask them uh, about their personal experiences related to your topic. And if there's a hot topic that you know your interviewer or your audience wants to hear, your opinion on, bring it up. Give it to them with your solid stance and then ask them if they agree or not and why. So this is also another way to engage people. Next. <clears throat> um, 
yeah, he messages media toolkit. So uh, we have developed a media toolkit um, that we can share after in, at the end of the training. I will share the link. Um, but on key messages, um, there are five things that we aim to do when we are creating our key messages. So first of all is to speak to people's best self good compassionate sides of people uh so think about the audience not as your villain um but as someone that can relate to the story and engage with your cause so don't paint them as the problem create common ground as i spoke earlier find the identity and the values you share with your audience so for instance um young people in their own lives, how you can bring the subject to different um, audiences. Uh, so how do you speak about climate change with the youth? How do you speak about climate change with middle-class housewives that don't um, have fam familiarity with the issue? How do you speak about that with um, academics and professors? So there's different ways to speak about the same thing with different audiences. And we need to create a common ground and find those identities and the values you share with each of these audiences. Talk about change. So as I said, explain the, the problem, but also present the solution and talk about specific demands. How do we wanna solve this problem? And what are the demands for each of our targets? Embedded, sorry, embed facts in stories. Don't rely on facts and figures alone, but appeal to people emotionally rather than rationally and put a human face on the issue. So always try to personalize the story you're telling. Try not to respond directly to your opponent's claims. So use your frames with your values and your vision. Let them talk what they need, what they have to say. Um, so for instance, uh, with the climate strikes, uh, the youth climate strikes, um, some of the key messages uh, are that this moment demonstrates that people are no longer willing to continue with business as usual. Uh, the urgency of the climate crisis requires a new approach and a just response centered on human rights, equity, and justice. So uh, yeah, it's always good to emphasize um, the values. So which are the values here? Human rights, equity, justice, the urgency of the climate crisis. So bring this up when all these, these um, values up when you're setting up your key messages. Next, getting in the media. Okay, so how to deal with journalists now? Understanding journalists, reaching out to journalists and on the day of an interview. Um, now that we have touch it on uh, messaging, we are going to look at some of the ways we actually get into the media with our stories and our messaging. Next. Yeah, no, you're, you're already there, Tony, thanks. Uh, so what media wants? Uh, the job of a um, journalist is to tell a story and they need to use accurate, useful, timely, newsworthy information that will connect with their readers, listeners, or viewers. They need reliable source of information and they need good visuals and or sound bites. Next. Understanding journalists and making contacts. So journalists are all humans and like, just like us. So we don't need to fear them, even if sometimes they are a bit intimidating with their questions, but try to read them as the humans they are. 
just like us. Next. Um, another really important thing to do is to know your media landscape. So anytime you are doing a communications plan or communications work for a campaign or a project, uh, you need to list and really understand your media outlets, uh, both local and, and regional or international. So the first things to do is research your local and regional media scene, which outlets and journalists are covering uh, stories already related to your topic. Um, a good strategy is to create a Google News alert so you can monitor and keep up to date with stories and create and keep updated uh, a media list. Uh, and if you cannot do that, either because you're um, short on staff or a small team, uh, there's always a friendly NGO that can do that for you. And we at 350 are one of them. Um, so rely on partners as well to do that. And also use social media channels for media outreach. Um, it's, it's a growing um, market. And we are starting to do a lot of uh, pitching through Twitter, for example, and a lot of journalists are reaching out to us directly to Twitter or Facebook or even LinkedIn. So also use social media to that. Next. So now getting into the shoes of a journalist. Um, what is the, the, like the, the landscape of a journalist? Uh, they have multiple stories per day. They have time crunch, short deadlines. Short, they are short on space or air time. They need to convince their editors. So it's not only a story that they wanna tell. Of course, some more VIP journalists have this, uh, their own, uh, they're more independent on that, uh, but most journalists still need to convince their editors. Uh, they have information overload um, and they need to balance that with what is really newsworthy. They are under-resourced, so they don't have money to travel. Uh, they, yeah, they, they can't be in every, place um, at the same time. So we need to provide them with everything that we can to help us and uh, to help them and support them to build the story that we want them to tell. And sometimes they are also a bit lazy too. So we need to take that into account. Uh, knowing their situation help us sympathize more with them and identify, uh, relate to that human side and build up relationships with them. Next. So ways to reach out to media. There are a couple of ways and a couple of um, outputs that we commonly use. First of all is um, outreach, targeted pitching. When you call someone directly and individually, and offer them um, an exclusive or a specific uh, pitch and story that you think identifies with their editorial line and with the stories that they already tell. Uh, there's media advisory, which is something that we send ahead of a specific event, a press conference or an action or a a, a mobilization or anyway, a, a panel. So it's it's usually shorter and concise with direct, uh, very direct with the information that you need, what, when, who, um, and where. And there's the, the PR, which is a, a bit longer in format than the media advisory. Uh, it usually, it usually gets quotes in there with uh, people that 
are featured in the story. Um, there, are, there are op ads, which are opinion pieces in longer form with a side, a specific side and specific uh, focus. Um, so here is a couple of examples of a media advisory template and in the next one, a press release template. You can have a look at it later on. I will share, I can share this presentation with you. And also in the media toolkit that I'll share, uh, we have every template um, for all the outputs too. Next. Next. And finally, um, last but not least, we have images, which are also very important. So images also tell a story. Uh, every time you're doing a, a campaign action or a mobilization, uh, take pictures and record videos, even if they aren't perfect, we can use for social media and it, it's a documentation. Um, close in details and big picture shots, they are both important. So every time you can try to take uh, both um, sides, close in plus big pictures. Uh, share with everyone you can, if you can send it to specific photographers and photo editors or multimedia desks, or even with partners that have, uh, that have a, a, a big media list, share with everyone you can, and also on social media. Captions count. So it's not useful if you just share a picture without explaining what it means. Uh, so you need to say at least what is happening at that image, who is pictured there, where is happening it, where, where it is happening and when was it. So these four basic information are crucial. And use it now and later. So always remember that uh, documentation can be used on the day of the action, but is, it's also something that it's evergreen. You can use along the campaign when you have a longer term uh, campaign. Next. Okay, so now it's uh, the final uh, section of our training, which is interview tips and tricks. I'll pause here a little bit just to see if folks has have any questions or comments so far. Otherwise, we can move on. I see Miriam on the chat. It will be great to share your templates. Yes, I'll definitely share it. And the media toolkit uh, that uh, we're gonna share after, it's really complete and comprehensive. So it has everything that we touched here, but also all the templates. So it should be very useful for you. Okay, let's move on then. Um, so in this section, we're gonna focus on Tips and tricks for giving interviews, how to stay on message, how not to respond to attacks uh, from the opposition and set your agenda, how to bridge tricky questions, uh, how to hit your key messages early on and get them into your first answer if you can. Okay, next. So first of all, uh, as we spoke before, uh, we need to create a common ground, right? We need to establish a connection with your audience and appeal to shared compassionate values and a shared identity. So first of all, you need to understand what is the audience uh, you're trying to reach and what are and identify what are the identities and the shared values of this audience. Uh, Try to always universalize what you say to create an idea of solidarity and shared humanity. So it's it's always best to say we than I. 
we all want a, a safer world and a healthier world. What we can all agree on is that climate change impacts every corner of the globe and, and we are all responsible for that. No matter where we come from, most of us feels, feel the impacts of, of climate change. So we all deserve, we all have a right to. So always try to bring this shared solidarity, idea of solidarity. Uh, when a spokespeople speak from their, from their own perspective, uh, as a climate activist, I feel like you self-marginalize. So people think I'm not a climate activist, so this isn't relevant to me. So it may sometimes be strategic to name agency and accountability uh, or explicitly raise up marginalization. So try to bring your own perspectives and your own marginalized uh, identities to, to what you're saying as well. Next. How to bridge tricky questions. There are a couple of tips for that. Um, it's, it's unlikely for younger speakers uh, if, or if you don't come from a more controversial organization or break background, uh, but it's always good to be ready. Um, so <clears throat> you always have the right to say no or refer the question to someone else uh, to say, I don't wanna answer this question now, or I don't have uh, the most accurate um, information or, or data to reply to your question, uh, but I can check this and get back to you. Uh, or I have an expert and you can name someone that can speak to that question. So you have the right to say that. Um, first of all, do not panic or do not pretend to hold the calm. No, sorry, pretend to hold the calm uh, in all cases. And in your response, do not repeat the negative question, question from the journalist. Try to bridge that. So we call this strategy ABC. Acknowledge what they're saying, bridge to what you, to your key messages, to what you want to communicate and communicate uh, your key messages. So acknowledge their point, bridge away from it and communicate what you want to say. And politicians do that, do, do this a lot. So we have something to learn from them. Um, another tip is to keep your body and facial language in check. Uh, don't um, don't let them uh, understand or, or feel that you're nervous or that you're uncomfortable with that. Uh, don't give that them that pleasure because what they want to do is to make you uncomfortable. And ways to answer tricky questions, at least to start bridging them, is to say, okay, I see what you mean. I see that. But and then bridge away and, and bring your key message. Uh, or what I'm most worried about is not um, this, but this. So you, you bridge away and get back to your message. Or people have said that, but, and then bring a message. I think the real question here is, we should be, that the real question that we should be asking is, and then you bridge back. I'd also like to add that, and what's important to remember is, or to put this in perspective is, so these are ways uh, that you can bridge um, tricky questions. And we're gonna see a couple of examples and have um, a short exercise, uh, a few slides later, uh, but I just wanted to bring this here now. Let's move on, Tony, please. Okay, this is a technique um, that is called back of envelope. And it consists on having um, a paper or a back of envelope and where you're gonna write down 
everything that you need um, to be on track with your key messages and, and be ready for an interview. So first of all, you write down the host or the reporter, someone that will be asking you, the journalist that will be asking you the question. So you, you don't forget their name. Uh, name, you can also add names of other guests if it's a debate or a panel with more people. A personal mantra, uh, which is something that keeps you calm and yeah, make you, makes you feel more comfortable. Um, yeah, like social justice, climate justice is social justice or something more personal like, um, yeah, I don't know. I just want to go to bed after this. I just want to go to bed after this. A personal mantra that will keep you calm and keep you uh, your feet on the ground. Um, and then a smiling face. Uh, it's always good because it reminds you to smile, even if it's a tricky or uh, annoying a question. Keep your smile. Uh, and also the name of the marge. Try to name someone, uh, one of the marges of your life that you will be speaking to personally. So name them and have it in mind. And then next slide. And then we have the triangle, which are the three key messages around the outside. Uh, and in the middle, we have the phrase that pays, which could be a metaphor or a visual language. So we have, first of all, the shared value, then the problem and the impact, and then the solution. And in the middle, the phrase that pays, okay? So for instance, um, let me think, um, okay. Let's share uh, an example of COVID and the pandemic. So the shared value is uh, health and life, life, people's lives matter, right? So what is the problem and the impact? The impact, the problem and the impact is the pandemic. And the impact is that governments are not uh, providing enough money or resources or the vaccines needed to or even going even further uh, resources uh, for health sectors um, in different countries and the solution what is the solution that we need we need vaccine we need resources from governments so what is the phrase that pays we need action action needs to be taken on covid misinformation across social media platforms because lies cost lives. So this is a short example of the phrase that pays. It brings um, the shared value because uh, lives uh, matter, lives, uh, we need to save lives. Uh, the problem and the impact is the misinformation across social media. The solution, action needs to be taken. What is the solution? We need to stop misinformation, um, prevent misinformation, regulate social media uh, to avoid misinformation. And the phrase that pays, lies cost lives. So this is a short example of uh, a back of envelope technique with a specific topic. Or another example, the poor wages paid by corporations like Amazon risk forcing workers to food banks to put food on their families' tables. So it's another example of that. Um, uh, yeah, just to, to wrap up on this uh, back of envelope technique, please go to the next slide, Tony. Okay, and at the bottom, um, below the, the triangle, we say, we see the, we write down the ABCs, how to acknowledge, bridge, and communicate. 
uh, any stats or numbers or data that is relevant to your topic, to your story, and a, a personal story, a story, a human story. Put a human face on on the problem and the the story you you are telling. Any questions on this technique so far, or comments, or did you understand what what this means? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, cool. Move on, moving on then. Um, yeah, so your safe and strong answer. Uh, we, we keep saying this, that it's always very important to bring the human aspect and humanize and, and sympathize and try to bring your own individual uh, experience to the story you're telling. So you're stronger when and, and safer when you bring those aspects, your personal um, and your own experience to, to what you're, you're trying to say. So always think about what is the real reason you became involved in climate activism or in your specific campaign? Uh, was it a single event or did you read something that personally motivated you? Think about this and the emotions it brings to you personally. And this is likely a strong feeling that will stay with you at your uh, innermost core. And this is something that will also speak to others' emotions. So whenever you bring up your own experience and your own emotions, uh, it's it's easier to uh, to uh, connect with others' uh, emotions and that they can relate to, they can sympathize to. Find a way to simply exp express this topic. Uh, like once I saw images of a draw and it has caused crops to fail and there was a report showing people with no food, the images struck me and I voted to do something about it. So you simply, it's simply put, you just shared uh, a specific event that um, you identified with, you related to, uh, and it brought you um, to consciousness and, and made you feel uh, you wanted to do a move. You want to change that uh, context and do something about it. Such experience and emotions they bring out are things we don't easily forget. So if we are in a difficult interview, lose our place or don't know how to answer a question, we can also pivot to this safe answers. Bring back to your own to your own heart, to your own feelings, uh, to what speaks to your truth uh, and to your values. So bring your individual experience, individual emotions to, to the scene. And as we learn voice and persona account for 90% of an interview, actually this is uh, a bit further in the in the presentation, sorry. But I'll get back to this. Um, it's simply that uh, there is a research that says that only 10%, um, only 10 is about the content of what you're saying. Uh, people, um, the voice and the persona account for 90% of an interview. People relate more to how you're saying your tone of voice and how you're behaving then what you're really saying, what is really the content of, of what you're saying. And we can, uh, when we tap into these deepest emotions uh, and our own personal passions, it taps into our real strength. Uh, with a little practice, this can help us deliver strong, passionate answers and ones that the viewer will connect to, connect to and likely remember. Next. So now we have uh, a, an exercise, uh, which was going to be again uh, in groups, but let's do that um, individually. We have here uh, three scenarios um, 
And I want, I'd like to propose uh, you to read, select one of them. Actually, uh, there are two of them, but the, the third one is a, a real scenario, scenario that you or your organization or your group is um, already working on and dealing with. So choose one of them and try to come up with three key messages uh, for the chosen scenario and try to use the following guide to frame them. Uh, can you pass on to the next slide real quick, Tony, please? So the, the questions that we want you to think about when you come up with uh, those three key messages. What are our shared values? What is the problem? What is the impact that it is having in your communities, in your neighborhood, in your group, or in the world? What is the way forward in addressing it? What are you doing about it? And what is the phrase that pays, that will stick in people's minds? We want um, key messages to be short and concise. We should be we should be able to read them or speak them in 30 seconds or less. It needs to be strategic. Um, it needs to be simple and easy to understand language. So avoid jargons and acronyms. It needs to be relevant. So balance with what you need to communicate with what your audience needs to know. And it needs to be memorable. So easy to recall and repeat, avoid long sentence, and it needs to be real. So use active voice, not passive. And whenever possible, try to bring that shared humanity that we spoke about, shared solidarity, and, uh, and, and speak about the we, the us, and not only yourself. Is that Clear? Yeah. Cool. So, um, Tony, please go back. Yeah. So you can read the, the scenarios and choose one. And then after you, you've you chosen, we can go back to the, the other slide so you can read the questions and, and try to answer them. them. So let me know. Just put a, a thumbs up when you're you choose one of the scenarios. Um, are, is this for a specific media purpose that we're crafting the messaging and, and so on? What is, is this for an interview? Is it for a press release? Like what's it for? So it should be for an interview, but you can like, it's uh, think about a campaign or a project that you're launching um, and you're promoting this either to an interview or um, to a targeted pitching. Wouldn't I wouldn't say a PR because uh, it would be more, more developed. So now we, what we wanna see here, it's only three key messages to try and, and describe your campaign. So yeah, you can either choose one of, the campaigns you're already working on or one of these scenarios and then just come it's an exercise to create your own key messages for interviews or uh to write down a, a pr you will you also need to to know your key messages but it's more focused on on interviews yes and just uh piggybacking here on jess question uh, in the chat, is the phrase that pays something you repeat or say for an, for an impactful moment? Yes, that's exactly what this means. It's something that will stick to people's minds, that people will remember. Um, it's, it's, uh, it can be a metaphor or, yeah, or just something short and concise that sticks to, to people and, and they can repeat that. Is everyone good to move to the next slide? Yeah? Yes. Cool. Okay. Okay, so here are the, the questions that, um, the prompting questions. Uh, you don't need to answer 
all of them, but it's just like to guide you. So we're gonna give around four minutes for this and, and then we're gonna share back. All right, um, this, who wants to share? Just to be clear again, uh, the idea is for you to share the three key messages based on those prompt questions. You don't need to answer each of them. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants to, cool. Uh, I see Natalie and Nurian added to the chat. Do you want to voice out what you shared real quick? I went last time, Natalie, do you want to speak? Okay. Um, I, it wasn't a lot of time. So I picked the IPCC one because I can imagine that as a local issue. So I picked that one, but I thought about local residents. Three key messages. One, the point of no return. The new climate report shows how quickly we're approaching a tipping point where irreversible changes will drastically change life as we've known it. Two, this time it's personal. When we hear how millions of people will die, starve, or become refugees, it can feel far away. What will happen here in Portland, where we all live, with some changes. Three, if we act now, we can save ourselves and our home. Phrase that pays, it's now or never, or there's no place like home. I don't know. I ran out of time for that. Um, so kind of appealing to self-interest of Portland residents. Really good, Miriam. Thanks. Um... So yeah, I really like uh, that you brought in the first point, uh, first of all, the point of no, no return. So you brought uh, a real report and a real, um, a real thing, a real uh, concept uh, that is backed up by data, by reliable data. Uh, you also um, brought like this shared value uh, of, the possibility of people becoming refugees um, and far from home. And then you you connected this to your phrase that pays that there's no place like home. So it, it's really appealing for everyone because um, everyone wa um, wants to preserve their own homes, uh, no matter where it is or uh, the difference between one and another, but it's something that people really relate to. Uh, so I really like that. And yeah, I think, yeah, I think maybe one thing that I'm missing that I'm missing here is uh the way out, the solution. How what we what are we going to do to try and solve this? We are persons, uh, citizens, and civil society, uh, and also what we want from authorities and governments, what are our demands for them to do that. You, you brought up really good um, the problem itself, uh, but I miss maybe something around what's next, what we should do now in terms of uh, real solutions, both for us as citizens uh, and for authorities, yeah. but it's really good. And the phrase that pays, both of them are, are really good. Okay, thank you for engaging in this short exercise. Let's move on because we are running a bit tight on time. So uh, media interviews. That's the, 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 the statistics I, I was uh, mentioning earlier. Delivery matters. And there is a research that says that content is less than 10% of the presentation and voice and persona account for 90% of it. So now we're gonna learn how to prepare for an interview, uh, both uh, identifying the difference between um, kinds of interviews and also how to use your body language, um, your outfit, and all that. So next, Tony, please. Okay. Um, first of all, when you're 
you you receive a media request for an interview, uh, the first thing you should do is try to get uh, the most details you you can uh, on the setting from the journalist. So whether it's live or pre-recorded, the length of the, of the interview, the program, uh, the storyline, um, or the bias of the outlet or the program, understand the media outlet and if you will be up against someone or not. Um, and then start with the easy stuff. Practice, don't. Uh, you don't need to elaborate the setup, just practice, practice, practice in front of a mirror or recording it uh, or with a friend. Develop your key messages in a Q&A, something that you can predict that you're going to be asked and then you know how to answer. Uh, so what are your, what are you most likely to get asked? Double check your statistics and have a source at hand. Check your opponents uh, on Twitter or other social media to try and, and understand the arguments they will likely present. Find a quiet space to practice and do what you feel best. Next, your outfit. <laughs> it might seem, um, yeah, like, uh, superficial, but it, it counts, especially for TV. Uh, confidence, personality, and credibility. So whenever you can, uh, wear something that makes you feel comfortable and confident. You don't need to wear a suit. We are all activists. Uh, and we don't, we don't want to pretend we are something else. Uh, but wear something that you feel confident enough and that shows that you are in the position, in the right position to be speaking about what you're gonna be speaking. And specifically for TV or studio, uh, we need to wear makeup, like it or not. <laughs> uh, no busy patterns, no shiny materials and avoid black and white. Next. Types of interviews, uh, we have three types of interviews. On the ground, which is generally when you're being interviewed by a reporter or a presenter at the site of or close to the news story. So for instance, outside a town hall or at a protest. Um, and tips for this kind of interview are to try and stand relaxed with your hands rested in front of you to look at the presenter when responding to the questions. Uh, don't look at the camera unless it's down the line, which is a different type. Uh, not too many big gestures or hand movements like this. Uh, it's possible only the top half of you will be on screen. Don't get up until you're told to once the interview has finished. And we have down the line. Uh, which is um, for broadcast specifically and means uh, when you are in a remote location doing an interview to camera or on the, on the radio, which the presenter is in the studio somewhere else. So you're uh, both remote in different uh, places. For this type of interview, uh, maintain the focus because it's it's harder to maintain the focus when you are apart from uh, from the, the people you're speaking to. Always look directly into the camera. Remember to smile or at least look friendly. Not too many big gestures, again, same. And stay on in your seat, looking straight at the camera until you are told the interview is finished. And the third type of interview is in studio. Um, and this style, uh, this interview style takes place in the studio with the presenter in person, generally uh, on a one on one scenario. But sometimes there is also another guest. In this case, try to appear relaxed, your legs cross at the ankle, hands loose in your lap, 
shoulders back and smiling, if appropriate. Look at the presenter when responding to the questions. Don't look at the camera. Try not to move around too much in your seat uh, and don't get up until you're told once the interview has finished. And don't forget that you have a mic uh, on you. So don't say anything you don't wanna say. <laughs> um, and with all of them, take a deep breath, speak slowly, more slowly than you would normally. And remember what the messages you have to say are. Next. Body language is also something that really counts. So sit on the edge of your seat, look directly at the camera when appropriate, straight back, but relax it, shoulders back, smile when appropriate, focus on your breath. And if you are on the phone, stand up. Next. Voice. Again, take a nice deep breath before speaking and start in a low pitch. Smile when appropriate. Also on radio, people can, uh, can um, perceive if you're smiling or not, even if it's only a, a voice. Speak slowly, listen to the end of each word you're saying and aim for 40 seconds to one minute answers. Next. During the interview day, general tips, prepare in advance and practice. Uh, look at your state of mind. If you're comfortable enough, if you're in a mood to do that, that day. And remember, you can always say no. Try to feel confident. And tips for TV and radio are voice modulation, looks to count plus eye contact. Be short and clear on your speech and smile also for radio. Remember that the more prepared you are, the less anxiety you will have. And there's no need to over prepare, but um, at least having the three key messages and, and three clear points that you wanna bring up is really important. Do a short breathing exercise before going on air or on camera and make the sound check before a live interview or some sounds in the air to feel your own voice and confidence. Next. Tax setup. Now, these days, it's something that's really important because we are doing a lot of online things. So make sure you have a good internet, internet connection Test your microphone, put your camera at eye level, put a sticker or a smile face next to your camera to remind you to smile, frame your head so it's in the center. And what does look at your background, what does your background say about who you are? This is also something to, to care about. Don't be too close to the wall behind you because it's it shortens um, your, your body. Uh, and avoid light from just one side or a dark room. Next. <clears throat> okay, so now we're gonna watch this um, interview very quickly. Can you play for us, Tony, please? Uh, Can it's you so hear interesting. The this march is about to take place uh, here in Spain. Um, if there's going to be a simultaneous march in Chile. So you were going to host the UN Climate Summit there, but then the protests led to its cancellation. Talk about the significance of this. Well, so as Fridays for Future as well in Chile, we have been mobilizing for the whole year and hoping that people in Chile will wake up. And it's very inspiring to see like the whole movement that has started since October for the social crisis and people woke up and that's very inspiring. But at the same time, it's terrifying to see how we're getting. So I think partly it was like a very strategic move to change the cup from Santiago to Madrid, because since it was suspended in Chile, 
uh, the international mainstream media is not uh, really talking about Chile anymore. And now it's been shocking for me to participate at COP and going inside and seeing all the greenwashing that I already knew that it was going to happen, but now it's also about human rights. And the speech that Sebastián Piñera sent in a video for the first day at COP was terrible. He was saying the that Chilean he... President yeah, Piñera, Sebastián. who canceled the COP in Chile. Exactly. And I think if COP was going to take place in Santiago, he was forced to listen to people and to hear their demands and try to solve the situation in a more democratic way. But he was not willing to do that. That's clear. And... That's what's saddening, but at the same time, I feel that this needed to happen in Chile, and it's really inspired to inspiring to see all people very empowered, and now we have the chance to write a new constitution from zero to, to get rid of uh, Pinochet's constitution. Um, so that's very meaningful, and we are achieving more than we thought we could, like maybe three months ago. Are you sorry he canceled the COP? Did it? Were you shocked when he announced it? I mean, you had um, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets protesting austerity, protesting inequality. He canceled both the APEC summit, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit, and the COP. And I had mixed feelings. I still don't have like one position because from like from one side is like you you see how. People is empowered and they can like take down two massive projects that the government had and had been planning for a long time that were really very meaningful. Uh, so people felt really like empowered that they could have that impact. At the other side, like I come from the, the social, like the environmental movement. So we had been like pushing for this um, like awareness and this movement for the whole year. So it was a shock and it was. It, it, I, we all felt like this bad impression of the decision, understanding that uh, Sebastian, like our president, was not willing to listen to people and to have an open dialogue. Talk about the connection between the climate catastrophe that we are all facing, the climate crisis, and human rights violations uh, in Chile, uh, particularly around the rights, for example, of indigenous people like the Mapuche. Yeah, well, in Chile, the Mapuche, like even like for centuries have been like facing the oppression of the state and human rights violations. And I think we have to learn from them in order to cope with the climate crisis. They have a different paradigm that have answers that we need to look at and respect. And if you see in the protests, what's been super interesting is that there are many flags with indigenous like Mapuche flag, more than Chilean flags. So that's a sign that we need to redefine our culture and we are like looking back into our roots for answers. So that's super inspiring. Uh, and then I wanted also to touch on like the human rights violations that are tied with the climate crisis and the fossil fuel industry, because something that's very huge in Chile is that we have sacrifice zones. So these are uh, communities that are forced to live right next to coal plants. And that this is one of the issues that we have been bringing throughout the year with the social and environmental movements. And we are demanding that they, they, they close down coal plants by 2030, all 28 coal plants. And I guess it's just important to call attention that now, for example, NG, that is one of the founders of COP25, is now uh, retracting from investing into re renewable energy and uh, the plan for decarbonizing our uh, energy system. Like just if being justifying itself that now the economic crisis in Chile is coming and etc. Thanks, Tony. So this is an example. Angela uh, Valenzuela is a Chilean um, activist from Fridays for Future, and she was speaking about COP25. Um, and I just wanted to 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 show that um, she used it like her main. Her main message, one of the, her key messages was on uh, humans and indigenous rights violations from the Chilean government. And when the presenter asked her about the connection between human rights and climate change, she used the question to convey the message uh, about the relationship between climate and human rights uh, violations. And especially he brought up, she, sorry, she brought up uh, and named the fossil fuel industry as one of the main villains of the climate crisis, which is one of um, their targets as well. 
so she really uh pass it on and communicate it really greatly uh, her messages. She also mentioned the demands of the movement and show it in numbers, how many coal plants they want the government to shut down. So she mentioned it clearly what were the demands and what they wanted they wanted from the government to, uh, from the government to do. So this was just a brief example. Uh, next, please. Uh, so this is very briefly because we are running out of time. Um, after you start acting as a spokespeople, it's also good to build up your profile on social media to appeal to producers, but also um, create your own uh, persona in, in social media as like a reliable source uh, of information, um, an activist uh, and a spokesperson, like someone that uh is an expert on specific topics and it is important to um comment on specific uh news and and subjects and and always try to take a side and 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 share your position on on an issue next another good uh tip is to record a one minute video of yourself explaining who you are, presenting yourself, and also uh, speaking about the issues that you're, you're expert on. So showing producers and, and reporters what you are like as a speaker, um, and also giving them the confidence to book you for, for interviews. And it's also a great practice. Uh, the two next slides you can pass on, uh, Tony, because it was a uh, one last uh, exercise, but we don't have time anymore, unfortunately. So I'm just going to open the floor for the five final minutes to any questions or comments you might have. If there's none, uh, I'm just going to share in the chat the link to the media toolkit that you are very welcome to use in your future communications or media work. And also my email, if you have any further questions or comments or follow-ups um, or anything, just feel free to reach out.